I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4 this morning. Exodus, the fourth chapter. It's one of the uh, most famous passages uh, in the Bible, Exodus chapter 4. And uh, you know Moses is, is standing there and he sees something glowing and he walks up and, and God, God starts talking to him out of, out, of, out, of a, out of a burning bush. And so we're in Exodus chapter 4. Uh, let's begin. Um, what do we got? We got verse number one. Yeah, then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me. Have you ever said that to someone? You, you, ever, you ever had a conversation with, with someone and, and the conversation started out and suppose they will not believe me. Um, that's, about, that's about the feeling I get uh, when I try to tell you a, a life story and you all look to Taffy for confirmation. So... <laughs> It's all right. It hurts. It hurts. Um, uh, stairs can wound. That's all right, just as long as you're okay with that. Uh, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, there's a lot of supposing, isn't there? Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord, it's his turn to talk. And the Lord said to Moses, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. Some translations say a stick. And he said, God said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. I guess so. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand again. That they may believe that the Lord... God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you, God says. So let me, let me give you a little backdrop, a little summary on what's, what's going on right here. Uh, to summarize, uh, God had already set Moses up as a young Hebrew boy growing up in an Egyptian palace. God was preparing him to one day be the deliverer of his people. But Moses made some bad choices. He, he walked out one day and he saw an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew. And, and Moses thought he would take care of God's problem um, one person at a time. God had wholesale plan for Moses. But, but Moses had retail on his mind. And so he, he, saw, he thought he would take care of this problem one Egyptian at a time and and so the Bible says it like this. The Bible says he looked this way and he looked this way. But he forgot to look this way. And he, and he killed him. True north. That's good. I hear that. Praise. Preach it. Okay. So he, 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 he didn't honor God. He, he went out on his own, did his own thing, killed the Egyptian, tried to bury him in the sand. Of course, you know, your sins will always find you out. And uh, long story short, he ends up running into the wilderness, fleeing from Egypt. And for 40 years, Moses was camouflaged from his purpose. And after 40 years of being camouflaged from his calling and his purpose, he finds himself standing atop of a mountain, staring at a burning bush. And it's out of that bush that God speaks to Moses and begins to remind him that though decades have passed, his purpose is still intact. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sermon for somebody in the house this morning. And, and I love the first thing that God says. We started in Exodus chapter 4, but in Exodus chapter 3, don't go there, but in Exodus chapter 3, I love how it starts. God looks at Moses and speaks to him from the bush and says, take off your shoes because the place you're standing is holy ground. Then there's two reasons why God had him take off his shoes. The first is obvious, because it's holy ground. God, the, the presence of God is there. You're going to reverence the Lord. You're going to honor him. Take off your shoes. But there's another reason he told him to take off his shoes. It's because God is telling Moses, it's time to take your shoes off and stop running from your purpose. And I believe there's some people in this room this morning that God has a message for you. And that message is, it's time to take your shoes off and stop running from your purpose. God has a plan for you. Come on. He has a calling for you. Um, 
Moses was full of fear. And uh, he began to offer God all kinds of excuses for why he couldn't do it. And I remember as a young teenager, I remember when I realized that God had put a calling on my heart and life to preach. Um, I, I knew it was on the inside. I didn't know how to get it to the outside. And, and I remember the day that my pastor came to me and invited me into his office. And, 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 and he sat in front of me and he said, Doug, he says, I, I got to tell you, I feel very strongly that God is directing me to have you share your heart and what he's put on your heart to the congregation. And when he said that to me, his, his name was uh, Brother Morrill. And, and when he said that to me, I laughed. I laughed at my pastor. Uh, because for me to get up in front of church and preach meant I would have to stand up in front of real people and talk. And, and that to me was hilarious. And, and so I said to my pastor, I said, listen, I'm going to do you a solid favor. We're going to forget that this conversation ever existed. And I'm going to save you and God from, from being terribly embarrassed for making a horrible mistake. And uh, obviously, you know how the story ended. Um, here I am. Uh, in front of real people. Yeah. Um, but Moses, he, he, he's, he's afraid. Um, and the Bible says that God looked at Moses and said, what is that in your hand? And Moses said, it's a stick. And God said, throw it down. And he threw it down. And it turned into a snake. In other words, it became sensational. And, and, and God said, pick it up by the tail. Now, now, when it became a snake, your Bible says Moses ran from it. And, and I get that, by the way. I, I would have too. <laughs> How many would have too? Yeah. I, I, was, I remember when I was about 13 years old, I was mowing lawns to make some money and uh, there was this one house, this guy, I would mow his lawn. It was a ranch, a horse ranch. Uh, it was called Kent's Arabians. And, and I was in the back part of the property. I was mowing the grass and, and cutting, cutting grass. And, 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 and I, I got my lawnmower over a thick part of the grass. And I, I, I felt something grab. And I, and I pulled back and I, I, I squatted down. And I noticed that I had just ran over a bed of snakes, not, not a snake. But, but a bed of snakes, and I, I knew I had chopped some of them up. I didn't know how many were there, but, I, but I, I, I panicked, panicked, immediately hit. And particularly, and this is God's honest truth, is when one of those snakes ran up my pant leg. And all I can tell you is, yeah, it was just like that, sister. It was just like that. And, and all I can tell you is I took off running. I left the lawnmower running. I ran out down the long driveway. It was a horse ranch. I ran into the street. I ran down the street all the while reaching down, trying to grab that snake out of my pants. And I, I got into my house, got into my bedroom, shut the door, and that was, that was my career ending, uh, lawn, lawn ending career moment. Uh, but, but Moses, Mo Moses was, 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 was terrified. And God said, pick it up by the tail. There's a great scripture. It's in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. I think you guys got it there for me. Let me just read this to you. So Moses, this is in the New Testament, Acts chapter 7, verse 22. So Moses was fully trained in the royal courts. Can you guys give me that scripture up there? It's Acts chapter 7, verse 22. There it is. So Moses was fully trained in the royal courts and educated in the highest wisdom Egypt had to offer. Listen to this. Until he arose... As a powerful prince, listen to this, and an eloquent orator or orator, a speaker, an eloquent speaker. Now, wait a minute, because if we go back to Exodus chapter 4, one of the excuses that Moses offered God was that he was anything but an eloquent speaker. In fact, the Bible says in verse 10 of Exodus 4, Moses answered and said, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Give me that scripture. Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before, watch this, nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, now wait a minute. Does the Bible contradict each other? In the New Testament, it says he was eloquent. In, in the Old Testament, Moses says he's, he's anything but eloquent. 
The Bible does not contradict. Let me tell you what's going on here. Moses was eloquent. But somewhere along the way, and I don't know if it was the wilderness, whatever, but somewhere along the way, he picked up a stutter. Now, I can't prove this, but, but here's what I think. I think when he threw that stick on the ground and it became a snake... And God said, pick it up by the tail. I think all of a sudden Moses said, w -w 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 what did you say, God? And, and he picked up this stutter. And I, I'm sure at this moment there are, there are experts who, who have gone to serpentine school who, who would tell us that, that everyone knows that God obviously doesn't know what he's talking about because anybody that knows anything about snakes knows that you don't pick a snake up by the tail. That's called the little end. Because if you pick it up by the tail, the head will swing around and, and get you. Come on, how, how many know when I'm, don't, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good this morning. And they'll say that proves that God doesn't know what he's doing. But how many know God says, my ways are not your ways? And God is saying it like this. You take care of the little stuff and I'll take care of the big end. You take care of the little end, and I'll take care of the big end. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe. That's the little end, and you shall have them. That's the big end. Bring all the tithe, we talked about it last week, into the storehouse. What, what? That's the little end. That's the little end. That's the 10%. And God says, and then I will rebuke the devourer. I will open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't even have room to receive. That's the big end. God told him, walk around the walls of Jericho. Not once, but seven days. Walk around the walls. That's all you got to do. That's the little end. And the walls came down. How many know that's the big end? And God told a, a young shepherd boy by the name of David, pick up five smooth stones. That's the little end. But the anointing that it took to take one of those stones and drive it to the exact spot at the exact time was God saying, I got this. That's the big end. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8, and God who is able to make all grace abound to you so that you having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. That's the big end. How many are thankful that God has taken the big end of your life? Come on, how many are thankful that God has taken the big How many are thankful that God says all you got to do is turn it over to me and trust me? Amen. Now I want to talk a little bit about that stick. It was just an ordinary, average stick. But when Moses surrendered it and took his fingerprints off of it, suddenly it became sensational. And it was able to do something that it would not have been able to do had Moses held on to it. Sometimes we think that we got to be super sensational. We got to be super talented, super qualified, super attractive, super popular if God is going to use us. But, but God, listen to me, church, is looking for more than, 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 than that. He's looking for someone who will surrender themselves and say, here I am. This is all I am. This is all I have. I want to be used by you, God, because sometimes all God needs is a stick. When the children of Israel and Moses stood out before the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was hot pursuit, God told Moses, take that rod and stretch it out. And the waters parted and they walked across on dry ground. Because how many know sometimes all God needs is a stick? And when they went out there into the wilderness and they stood out there in, in front of the bitter waters, the Bible says Amara. And, and, and Moses and God told, told the people, said, take a, a tree branch and throw it into the waters. And, and the Bible says the waters became pure and sweet. Because how many know sometimes all God needs is a stick? And when the prophet went up to, in 2 Kings, to a little widow woman who was preparing to make her last meal for her and her son. And, and he said, what are you doing? And she, the Bible says she was gathering sticks to make one last meal. And, and, and the prophet said, obey God. 
Make the cake. Give it to me first and watch the abundance of God. And, and the Bible says her, her, her meal multiplied and continued to flow because sometimes all God needs is a stick. And, and when they were building the school of the prophets and, and one of the young men in, in, in construction was swinging that axe and, and the axe head fell off into the deep waters and, and he was in panic mode and because he cried out, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the prophet said, take a stick and throw it into the water. And the Bible says, watch, it didn't say the axe head rose to the surface. It said the axe head swam. Can you imagine the axe head doing the backstroke <laughs> across the water? Because sometimes all God needs is a stick. And when our heavenly father was ready to redeem the world of its sin, he placed his only son between two sticks because sometimes all God needs is a stick. Quit saying you're unable. Quit saying you're inadequate. You're too ordinary. He's already looked past your excuses. And he's saying if I needed something sensational, I would have chosen that. But I chose you. And I, I know there's some of you in the room this morning. Please hear your pastor's heart. That there's, there's some of you in this room this morning. You're going through a season of drought or a season of difficulty, a wilderness season. And, and, and you're thinking to yourself, if, if I can get through the storm, then God, we can have this conversation. I'll, I'll move the needle. I'll, I'll let you use me. But God, I can't do it while I'm going through the season. Can I ask you a question this morning? Where did Moses get that stick? He, he got that stick in the wilderness as he was fleeing from Egypt. Had Moses never gone through a wilderness experience, he had never picked up that stick. And had he never picked up that stick, he'd have never been able to part the Red Sea. Listen, what the enemy means for harm, I, I, I want to tell you something this morning. Listen, God never intends for you to go through a dry season without picking something up. What the enemy means for harm, God says, I'll equip you with what you're going through, with what you need in that place, so that later on we can circle back, drop back on it, and I'll use it to bring you out mightily and use you in a mighty way. And you'll, you'll stand there and you'll be like, well, I know you think this is a test, but it's really a testimony. I, I know you think I'm facing problems, but really I'm just looking at the problem solver. I know you think all I see is a mountain, but what I really see is a mountain mover. I like that one preacher who's preaching all fired up one Sunday morning. He says, I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I'm a looking for one in the sky. Okay. Because sometimes all God needs is a stick. Sometimes all he needs, Moses is ready for the test now. And he goes with Aaron to Pharaoh, and he says to Pharaoh, God sent me here to tell you to let his people go. And Pharaoh says, why should I listen to you? <laughs> uh, and, and he tells Aaron to throw down Aaron's stick, Aaron's rod. And, and Aaron throws it down, and, and, and it becomes a snake, just like it did up on, on that mountaintop. Could, could you just imagine... Moses and Aaron walking in there with some swag. I, I, just picture, I just picture this level of confidence as Moses walks in. He's got a little bit of, he's got a little bit of Victor swag in him, you know, just kind of going through there. And, and he's, he's walking in there with some confidence. And you know why he's got some confidence is because he's already seen what God can do with a plain, ordinary stick. And, 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 and so it's, it's, it's a test now. And, and I, I got to tell you something. You, you get that kind of confidence. You remember when you were in school and you walked into the class and, and you were prepared for the test. You studied hard. You knew you were prepared. Well, wasn't it a different feeling when you, you kind of walked in with your head up a little bit? You walked in with a little bit of swag in your characters. You, you're like, I got this. I got this. Bring it on, teacher. Bring it on. I got this. Now, how many know the opposite is true? If you're not prepared for, for, and you walk in there and you sit down and the teacher says, put your books away and get ready for the test. And you say, what test? <laughs> how many of you ever experienced that? 
I've had that experience. Now, you know, you'd be proud to know that, that I, I graduated in the top 1% of the lower one-third of my class, so I understand, <laughs> I understand what it means to, to face a test. And, and, so, and, so, and, so, and so he throws it down, and, and you could just picture, you know, Moses there and Aaron, Pharaoh says, why should I listen to you? And Aaron pulls out that stick. And, and he casts it down, and, and the sensational happens, and it becomes a snake. And then, Mos and, then, and then Pharaoh yawns, and he calls for his magicians, and they go in, and they grab their, their sticks, and then they bring them in, and, and, and the Bible says they throw their sticks down, and they turn into snakes. Now, you have to understand they're magicians, they're not performing miracle. They're performing trickery, sleight of hand. So some, some commentators, some Bible theologians believe that, that they had snakes that were encased in some type of, in that day, silicone or some type of encasing, and that when they would throw those sticks down, it would, it would break the casing and the snakes would be free to move about. But it was trickery. But in that moment... Just about the time Moses is about ready to have a panic attack. The Bible says that God's snake begins to swallow <laughs> the other snakes. The, the other snakes. Here, here's the point this morning. And, and, and I want you to get this. And I guess I, I got you to this place this morning for this, for this purpose. To me, the greatest miracle here is not just that the stick could turn into a snake. It's that the snake could go back after God used it in such a massive way and become a stick again. Could it be that the key to experiencing the supernatural power of God after he throws us down on the stage of life and uses us to advance his kingdom is that we're able to just go back and be a stick? Aaron threw that stick down on the biggest world stage in front of Pharaoh and thousands of people. And God is saying, when you experience something like that, are you able to just go back and honor me and, and be a stick? I, I want to remind those of us who have been in church for a little while and who've been saved for a little while. And, and who, who've experienced what it is for God to, to bless you and honor you. Don't listen, don't ever, ever lose that passion and that humility that we started out with. Taffy and I have watched over the years as people have come through and they started out saying, I'm just clay. I, he's the potter. God, use me. God, take me. I just, I just want to be used. God, whatever you want from me, whatever I have, it's all yours, God. And then we watched as God blessed them and they experienced some success, and, but suddenly they get a big head. They start to think highly of themselves, and they, they get full of themselves, and we've watched as people have become self-promoters. I guess what I'm saying this morning is, can God trust you to sing the solo one Sunday and then go back to just worshiping him in the audience the next Sunday? I've watched over the years as people have, have, have come through the doors of Word Faith Fellowship and, 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 and their life was a mess. Their finances were, their relationship was a, ships were a mess. Their, maybe they got a bad report from the doctor. And, and as we do, as this house does, we, we've rallied around. I watched as Word Faith Fellowship, you guys rallied around them and you lifted them up and you, you prayed over them and you blessed them and encouraged them. And then I watched as the tide began to turn and, 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 and things begin to change and God began to bless and success began to come to their business and, and, and the reports that the doctors were, were giving out were changing for the, for the better. And I, and I watched and then, and then I, I just got to ask, I just got to ask the question, do, do they need him as much now that he's blessed them? Yeah. Are, are they... Are they in church or are they out on the lake? 
Y'all, y'all looking at me. I, I got real in the house this morning, didn't I? Are, are you understanding what I'm saying this morning? I mean, if I can't get a Pentecostal shout, I'll take a Baptist nod this morning. I'll take a Presbyterian cough. I'll take a, I'll take a Catholic sign. Whatever. You, just work with me this morning. Tell me, I hear you, Pastor. I hear you. I, I got to tell you today that you're going to have more stick days in your, in your Christian journey than you are snake days. You're, you're going to have, I know the snake days are sensational days. The wow, 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 wow days. And we thank God for those. And they happen. We honor Him. We thank Him for those days. But there's going to be more stick days than there are snake days. In marriage, there's going to be more stick days than there are sensational days. I'd I, I love it when young couples in premarital counseling come to me for counseling and and, and even though we're in this big room and there's all these chairs, they try to fit into one chair. And then they're practically sitting on each other's laps. And they're like, oh, pastor, pastor, we need to get married in a hurry before Jesus comes. Twelve years later, oh, quickly come, Lord Jesus. You know how it is. Taffy and I will be married 34 years this August. And for 33 and a half years... Can I tell you that most of the days have been stick days? That's just reality. Do you know, do you know that she doesn't care that, that my business card says senior pastor on it? <laughs> do you know that she doesn't care how many, how many churches invite me to go speak at their church during a year? She doesn't care how many likes I'll get today in my sermon on social media. You know what she cares about? She cares that, that I bring her favorite Tupperware home from the office. That's the truth. Do you know my two daughters growing up, they didn't care if I was a good preacher. They, they cared if I was a good dad who honored our family and loved their mom. Am I, am I, am I talking to anybody in the house this morning? <clears throat> I never read in, in the Bible after, after that exodus, I never read where God used that snake again. But I do read where he used the stick again. The day came, your Bible says, when God said he's going to appoint a high priest over the tribes of Israel. And of course... You know, it was like the floodgates opened up. Oh, pick me, pick me. I'm the best. I'm the greatest. I need to be it. I need, I'm your man. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the best qualified. And all, all this arrogance, and except for one, except for Aaron. And, and, and the Bible says God told Moses, he says, you take, you take one representative from each of the tri 12 tribes, and including Aaron, and you take the sticks, their, their, their rods, that represent their family. And you bring them in, these dry sticks, and you, you lay them in there before the Lord in the tent of God. And, and they did that, all 12. They just laid them out there like that. And the next day, the Bible says Moses went in, and all the, all the rods, all the sticks were, were, were all dried up, except for one. Aaron's rod was budding and flourishing with fruit growing out of it. The day came when God said, I, I want you to build me an ark that will house my presence. I, I, my, my presence is going to be in that box. Aren't you thankful this morning that his presence is in here today? Yeah. And, and we, can, we, can, we, we are surrounded by and, and he lives in us and rules and reigns in us. Thank yeah. God Almighty. But God says, I, I want you to build me an ark. And he told him how to build it, how big it was supposed to be, and what it was supposed to be made out of. And, and then God said, I want three things to be in that ark. He says, number one, I want the commandments of stone, the tablets to be in that ark, to represent the covenant that I have with my people. And number two, he says, I want you to get a pot of wilderness manna. And, and that's going to symbolize my, my everlasting, that I am, the, I am the, the, your everlasting source. And, and number three, God said, there's something else I want you to put in that ark. 
And I want you to notice that he didn't say, I want a snake in that heart. I want something sensational in the heart. And God says, I want the budding, blossoming rod of Aaron. As if, as if to say, listen, church, I'll resist the proud. But if you want to come near me and if you want to get close to me, and if you want my hand to be upon your life, and you want me, you want to experience my supernatural favor and blessing upon your life, you cannot come to me in arrogance. God says, I will bless you. I will lift you up. I will show you sensational moves of my spirit throughout your, your life. And I will honor you. I will throw you down on the stage of life and cause you to move the needle in mighty ways. But what I need to know is that can I trust you to just be a stick? Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. I, I, I remember Peter in the Bible. I, think, I, think, I love Peter because one of the, for him the difficulty was transitioning from every day with Jesus, every day sensational, and then not, then not having Jesus there. And, and the Bible says one day it came, and, and, and you know, Peter... Just because he walked on water once doesn't mean he was nicknamed the water walker. I mean, that was a sensational thing, and he'll never forget it. But the day came in John chapter 21. I believe this is it. It's not in my notes. I'm just, work with me here, people. In John 21, Jesus is, he's, he's resurrected from the dead. He appears before his disciples, and he's standing on the shores. And Peter is in the boat with the, with the other disciples. And Jesus is about, a, they're about 100 yards off, and Jesus calls for them to come. He's saying, Peter, come to me. And I just got to imagine, and John turns to Peter and says, it's the Lord. And I just have to imagine that Peter had a deja vu moment. Like, I remember another time I was in a boat, and the master called for me to come to him. And, and it was sensational. It was awesome. I walked on water. I mean, I, John, you remember, I walked on water. He's calling for me. It was deja vu. I, I can't help from think that Peter had that on his mind. And, and the King James Version says it like this. It, says, it doesn't say that he, he, he stepped, he, he dove into the water. The Bible says he plunged into the water. Sometimes you walk and sometimes you plunge. And the Bible says he swam over there to Jesus and Jesus looked at him and said, you love me? Peter said, of course I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And here's what I think Jesus was saying amongst it, many other things he was saying. I, I know, Peter, I know you've experienced the sensational. But right now I just need you to be a stick. Feed my sheep. 